Ajá. Ajá, ajá, 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 ajá.
Oh, don't you mean? Mike, Mike uh, which direction uh, is Cody in uh, uh, in relation to me on your screen? I'm in the middle. Yeah, she's in the middle. So, you, so he's on the other side of stuff. So. Want me to poke him for you? Yes. What side is he? Uh, your left. <laughs> Thank you. That'll do, Steph. That'll do. Oh, you're not the girl. The, or if you're on this side, that'll do, Steph. There you go. That's perfect. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Alright, so... Tonight's episode... As a, as a town? Tonight's episode, we're talking about biographical slash docudrama films because there's some biographical films that are docudramas, which is documentary to documentary dramas. But um, biographical films <laughs> are quite popular when they try to adapt a movie based upon this person's life or something that happened in our line of history in the past. Uh, there's plenty of them out there. There's just a shit ton. They, they always make them. Everybody gets their own biographical film at some point. Uh, so, we've got a I'm handful. I'm waiting for the Cinema Royale story to happen. <laughs> I was about to say that! I was about to say, like, someday we will have our story. Who knows? <laughs> but it depends who will play us, you know. So that's a good question. Uh... That's a good question. Um, that was someone good for me to play me. Someone first, who looks better than me, you know? First person makes a carrot top joke gets smacked. Yeah, yeah, right now. <laughs> People in the comments below, who would you want us to be casted as? Who would you cast for the Simmer Royale story? Leave a comment down below. Um, so, like I said, we have a handful. Take note, people. I take note, people. I want someone less agreeable than me. Someone who's like a celebrity, hot AF, but can pull off the portrayal of me, which is not going to be an easy task. I'll tell you now. She's right. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> can I get Matthew McConaughey to play me? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Screw that. I want Jason Statham. <laughs> <laughs> He's more bald than you. <laughs> you got more hair than Jason Statham does. And he's English too. It's like, boy. <laughs> yeah, James, the whole point is you have someone better looking than you, not uglier than you. Well, for me, I go no higher than Weird Al Yankovic. Thank you. I think he would. Yeah. Honestly, I've been. I mean, he's. <laughs> I mean, he's got the hair and everything, so he's just got tight ginger, stick a beard on himself, and some glasses, and why, hey. Yeah, I could. I could think Jack Black would be fine for me. So. There you go. Uh, a little side story there. Uh, let's move on here. So we are actually. I think I would have. I think I. I think I would have Jennifer Lawrence play me. Why not? She's good looking and she's quite funny, you know. So. She kind of does have your personality in a way. Where's the paper? Uh, she always. I don't know. She always plays. Uh, she she always goes on record saying she plays uh, characters who are more interesting than herself. That would be stuff. <laughs> Sorry, that just made me feel squeezed. <laughs> it, feels, it feels so good about myself. Thank you, James. It's true. So true. But can so, she sing? That's the question. Well, that's a good question. But we'll save that for another time for discussion because, Steph, guess what? Me first? You get to start it off. Yay, because Sam's not here. Okay, so um, I'm technically kind of bending the rules with this one because mine wasn't actually a film that was released in cinemas. <clears throat> mine is actually a television film, and this is probably the pe point where everybody boos me off the podcast. So I'll just let, I'll just give it five seconds just to let everybody boo me off. Mm -hmm. Okay, there we go. Right. So 
So my film that I picked, this is actually based off a event that happened in England in the late 80s. Um, this is what they what people have described as the worst football disaster in British sports. And this is, of course, the 1996 television film Hillsborough. Oh, is this uh, that? Is this that thing that I think Michael was talk, talk, telling me about? This is the that the big disaster that happened with with the stadium and all the people were stuck inside. Yes, and this is oh. the oh yes, and many people will notice, or younger people may notice, when you watch a football game nowadays, you realise there are no stands, because back before the Hillsborough disaster happened used to have stands so you'd have seats and whatever and of course you'd have the, the pens where people can stand but after the Hillsborough disaster the stands were taken away and now you have allocated seating for each stadium so this film was made by Granda TV for ITV um, made in 1996 broadcasted this is a docudrama styled film where basically you have interviews with the actors playing the family members of the people who were affected. And basically it tells the story of the disaster that happened on the 15th of April, 1989. Now, before I go into the film, I should probably explain what happened. Basically, it was the semi-final uh, of the FA Cup. Liverpool... One question. Okay. I just want to clarify, but when you say football, you mean uh, what soccer. we Americans call soccer. soccer. Yes. Okay. 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 Continue. Just so Long no one gets you... confused in the audience. Okay. So, football, soccer, whatever. It's a round ball you kick with your feet. Okay. So, it was the semi-final of the FA Cup. Uh, it was Liverpool versus Northampton Football Club. And basically what happened was is that they had to basically, um, so people were turning up for the game, uh, were very excited. And one of the things that was, um, that I guess caused the disaster was that Northampton football club fans were given the bigger end of the uh, Sheffield Wednesday um, stadium, all the seats and uh, you know, stands and whether on that side. And there was like many entrances to get in. But football, uh, Liverpool Football Club, they were the bigger team. And yet they all had to pass through one turnstile, which was Leppings Lane. So naturally you have all these fans turn up. I think it was over like 3,000 fans that suddenly turned up. And there was a massive crowd outside the grounds. So basically, um, the police were very scared that if something wasn't done, there was going to be a major crush and people were going to get killed. So what they did was that they um, walkie-talkied up to Superintendent David Duckerfield to open Gate C. Now, if they had kept Gate C closed, all the fans would have been able to ferry themselves in and make their way to two other pens that were actually very which were basically empty but no basically gate C was open all the fans flooded in mostly about 2,000 fans flooded into two pens that were already full and what happens is that um, also another thing I should mention is that they had um, these gates put Dog up pile. yeah they had all these gates put up um, to stop uh, fans invading the pitch, you know, and that sort of thing. And But the fact is, if you have the gates there, you have all these fans coming at the two pens that were already chock a block, what's going to happen? You have a massive build up and a crush. And most people were probably sitting there thinking, oh, you know, the, you must have been, you know, had to be there to see it, to believe it. But actually, it wasn't that case. Not only did everybody in the stadium see what saw what happened on that day, but it was broadcasted on live television. Because, like I said, it was the semi-final of the FA Cup. So, so every... you don't have to be there to no. see it. No. 
No, everybody saw it happening happening on telly, and even my parents remember watching it on telly and watching what happened. Because first it started off with just a couple of people coming onto the pitch, but then more people spilled over, and they were starting to see there was a problem, and the fact that they had to uh, and. You can see in all the clips on YouTube, you know, you've got people in the top seats trying to pull people up out of the crush. You've got people spilling over, fainting, collapsing. You've got people pulling out avatars. They actually pulled down advertisement banners to use as stretchers to take them to the gym, to the gym as, you know, a place to help resuscitate them. Unfortunately, this story of the disaster does not end well. Apart from Mike... Can you guess it wouldn't how many be a disaster people... if it ended well, would it? No. Apart from Mike, do you know how many people died as a result of Hillsborough? Uh... Right, yeah. Uh, are we talking thousands? Not thousands. Hundreds. You're close. Yes, keep going. You're getting warm. You're, cl a bit you're close. Uh, no, 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 a little bit lower. Oh, that's right, yeah. yeah lower yeah. than hundreds, yep, lower yep. than a hundred. Yep, 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 yep. Lower than hundreds. Lower than hundreds. So that's yeah. like a hundred, maybe up over a hundred? No, under a hundred. Under a hundred. Fifty. Up, sixty, seventy-five. Ninety. I Stop poking me in the butt, Mike. You're close. I feel, okay. like, I feel like we're playing a morbid game of the clock game from Price is Right. Higher. Okay. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. After the last person to die in 1993, after being in a vegetated state for four years, 96 fans lost their life. That is some... Um, and... Damn. Shit right there. And... 766 were injured because of that. 766 okay. were injured because of that incident. Yeah, I... I, I remember... I, I remember... Um, uh, the only thing that... Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Uh, she'll be back. Should be like just the, the doc about her own movie. Exactly. Uh, I rem I only remember one thing about this. Uh, uh, very little. Very little about this uh, particular event, and that's because uh, not too long ago, um, uh, Michael Kempton, um, a friend, a uh, friend of mine over in the UK, we've had him on the show before yeah. during the uh, during the Hanna Barbera episode. Mm -hmm. He came on, and he. Uh, 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 he and I were talking one day. He told me all about this in this particular incident, and um, it's kind of uh, there. There was so many legal repercussions after this mm -hmm. that it's it's hard to know. It, it's really uh, hard for me uh, personally to to know who. Uh, who to blame here and it seems like when you um, when you blame uh, I, I, I I don't know all the facts personally but when you when you blame everyone but the people who are trying to evacuate the stadium uh, it's really it's really oversimplifying it's really oversimplifying things. I think they narrowed it down to uh, specific planners who uh, who needed to be uh, who needed to be um, essentially legally reprimanded for this. And I think they went to jail. I can't recall. Um, but um, uh, but yeah, how much how much of that do you people do you put in how much of that do you uh, put on the people in charge of the event and how many how much do you put on uh, the and how much how much blame do you put on the people who were 
who were actually uh, in the audience who were trying to evacuate. Sorry about that stuff. I was trying to take the lead on the uh, uh, conversation. Okay. Uh, so essentially yeah, what I said was how do you uh, who's how much blame do you put in, on the people in charge and how many how much of the blame do you put on the people evacuating? Well, the thing is um, originally the fans were blamed. Um, basically, uh, as you see in the film, you see like some of the policemen uh, that have been called, it's like, pitch invasion, move, 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 let me, you know, let me pull in. And you hear someone say, let's smack a few scousers, let's smack a few scousers. But, you know, it, was, it, wasn't a, it wasn't that kind of fighting. It was actually people dying. And they say that people were fighting, but they were actually fighting for their lives. So then a couple of months after the disaster happened, the Sun put out um, an article um, with word from the police. Uh, basically, the police were blaming the fans, saying how they forced their way in and they were robbing the dead, peeing on them, beating up policemen and stuff. But it turns out it was not true. <clears throat> none of that? None of that. And basically, it was the police that were to blame and have always been to blame. So then, in and so then after Hillsborough, they had an inquest, naturally. And one of the things that happened was that there was a massive cover-up by the police. And so basically, with a massive cover-up from the police, um, with the inquest, they had three verdicts for it. Accidental death, unlawfully killed, or open. Do you know what verdict they went for? Accidental death? Accidental death. And then basically, um, well, yeah, so and it's accidental. It seems like it seems like. Yeah, but the fact that there was a massive cover up from the police, they couldn't put the unlawfully killed verdict in, which a lot of people would say because because of what because of the police mistakes and stuff and all the stereotyping they did, basically, it came out accidental death. But then in 2012, a new inquest was opened and they actually had evidence to back up how dangerous the ground was because in 1981, I think it was the semi-final uh, semi once again, um, basically they showed those pens and they showed people, you know, there was overcrowding so there were people spinning out, luckily there was no injuries or anything like that, but it was showing how dangerous that stand was and how, you know, the police just let people go through there. And they were making up things, like the police were making up things saying like, oh, they were drunk, they didn't have tickets and stuff like that. Many fans did have tickets. And the fact they made up how like, how the fans were blindsidedly drunk and stuff. Most of the people that died were youngsters. The youngest person to die was 10, 10 years old. And the oldest one to die was 67. So then recently in, tw actually I think it was last year, 26, 16, or the end of 2016, or beginning of this year, they finally have come to a new verdict, which was unlawfully killed. So now there's been prosecution put against the police officers and people who were in charge on the day. Um, I haven't heard anything. I think Duckenfield was, I can't remember what it was, but he couldn't get charged with Hillsborough because for some reason I cannot remember, which is ridiculous. You know, they should just, you know. Lock that man's up, lock that man up, and throw away the key. So that's the information yeah. about. So that's the information about the disaster itself, and of course they made a film about it. So like I said, it was made made by Granada TV for ITV in 1996, and docudrama. So you have like interviews of people that were related to the victims and tell the story, and you've got some fantastic acting in here, including. Um, Christopher Eccleston, who plays Trevor Hicks, who was the father of Victoria and Sarah Hicks. And you've got Ricky Tomlinson, who played John Glover, who was the brother, uh, not brother, father of Ian Glover. And it follows the, um, it follows the families of uh, four victims. You've got Adam Spirit, who was... Well, I think some of the names have been changed for identification, but you've got Adam Spirit who was 14, Sarah and 
Vicky Hicks. Sarah was 19 and Vicky was 15. And Ian Glover, who was 20. And basically, another thing that didn't really help the Liverpool fans that I've got to mention was the fact that actually the Liverpool fans didn't have a very good reputation for well being a well-behaved uh, fan club, in a way, because of the high school stadium disaster that happened in 1985. I, I don't know how many people were killed or injured, but the fact that apparently it started off as a riot caused by the Liverpool fans, you know, and people trying to flee the riot. <clears throat> Oh, this is Christopher Eccleston, the Ninth Doctor. Yes. Yeah, that's same, the same okay. person. Yeah. Yeah, and he actually does make a little cameo as the um, as a janitor in it. And basically, what happened was is that they had to try and um, you know get all the fans in by three o'clock because that was the time of kickoff. And in the inquest, they originally put saying that they had to declare everyone dead by quarter past three, when some of the families were saying that their relatives were alive as well after quarter past three and the fact that they died later but you know they couldn't say anything else so with this film i have to say at the moment this is one of my favorite serious films that i will watch every now and again because i discovered this film back in 2014 when i was sort of interested in this um event you know doing research on it and um everything about this film has been done perfectly. I mean, you've got oh. fantastic sets, props, costumes that were very accurate to the time zone, because I mean, even though this was filmed in the mid-90s, it's an event that happened in the late 80s, you know, so basically, you know, you've got things like the glasses, clothing, you know, things like that, the cars, and... Six years yeah. is, uh, can make a lot of difference. Oh, yeah, because I mean, the acting is fantastic, because the actors have to show a lot of emotion, you know, because, you know, you've got things like, you know, the emotion, uh, the, you know, there's emotions on all spectrums, you know, you've got the grief, the anger, the heartbreak, everything, and all of that was just captured amazingly, you know, people didn't, like, overdo it in places, they just did it perfectly, as if they were going through that scenario themselves, you know, because... You know, you're not going to sort of be like, sort of relatively calm, but you're not exactly going to be over the top. But they just do it perfectly, and they do it realistic. And the, there's some really good scenes in it that you can really kind of show um, how things have, like, um, affected them. Like, there's a couple of scenes, one of these scenes I've written down here, but there's about three other scenes with Trevor and Jenny, who were the parents of Sarah and Vicky, they've got one where the mum doesn't want to wash the bed sheets because she can still smell her daughters and everything. And it really ends up in the big fight where, you know, Trevor's trying to kick the door in and like Jenny's trying to hold it up just so the bed sheets and stuff. And also there's a scene where they're splitting out the stuff between them because Jenny says she wants to move to Liverpool to be closer to the girls. And Trevor's like, oh, but we can't, you know, we, we haven't got enough money for it. She's like, no, I want to move to Liverpool. So, you know, they end up splitting up in the end. Because, you know, and a lot of people did, I think some couples ended up splitting up. Some people, uh, including one of the characters, committed suicide because of it all. And the scene where they're trying to, where Trevor and Jenny are splitting up the stuff, it's done so perfectly. You know, it's like, it's basically how people would act when they're spilling up stuff. They're not like shouting and raving over it or whatever, but you know, they're trying to be grown up about it, but something happens and it's like, you know, this is ridiculous Look what's happened to us. And also there's another scene where they're in the inquest and they're having a meeting with their, I guess, lawyer. And Jenny says like, you know what's, you know, what's, you know where we went wrong? Listening to you, you know, didn't see all the time so we would have been better off screaming our heads off. And then, like, basically, it's a case where Christopher X is like, you know, she's like, oh, I didn't mean to say it. And he was like, you did. And it's a case where basically he sort of says about how he would have, you know, loved to have an indulgent wife. You know, it'd be so much easier than being calm, cool, and collective and whatever. And that sort of thing. And one of the things that's shown in here is the fact that um, they have a break for Christmas. And you can definitely see 
like all of the families um, pulling out Christmas decorations, but you can just feel the sadness in the air and the grief in the air because it's the first Christmas without one of their sons. That's the Glover family. And Eddie's spirit, who, who was actually not only the father of Adam, but he was actually in the crush and he got injured by it, but he survived and unfortunately his son died. Um, you see him driving his cab like he does in his job, but he keeps having flashbacks of the event when he's passing under a bridge. And so he's losing control of the car and whatever and gets pulled over by the police. So I guess in a way it kind of shows that he might have had post-traumatic stress disorder, which is quite natural to have happen. You know, a big, scary event that happened in your life and having little things like a bridge replicate the tunnel that people went into the pen. Oh that's yeah, I see. Normal. That's perfectly normal to get, you know, to have emotions over. And, um, you know, everything, like, all the actors in this film were brilliant, including the people that played the police and everything, you know. It's just done perfectly. And I forgot to say that this film takes place between 1989 when the disaster happened to 1991 when the original verdict of the inquest was put out and basically uh, there's so many things you see in this film you know you have like the fans getting excited about the match because they think yeah we're gonna go and see our favorite team and whatever and the music in it like one of the main themes pass basically it has a kind of neutral vibe to it you can listen to it in the credits uh the credit scene <clears throat> at the end it has a kind of neutral vibe, it has kind of a, a little bit of excitement, but it also kind of shows a little bit of sadness because you don't know, because you know this big event's going to happen, especially when they play it when, um, you know, the, the families are getting ready to go to the match, you know, it's like, oh yeah, this is really exciting, but everybody knows what's going to happen next, because we all know, know how history's played out. And so basically that's what I sort of have to say on the film, I highly recommend it. If anybody's looking for a biographical film about football and whether, or about any sort of major event that happened in England in the last, well, actually, this happened 28 years ago, so basically, roughly in the last 30 years, this is the film for you. And it's about an hour and about an hour and a half long, but it is fantastic. It's every hour. Well, here's the other question: Is that uh, you have to ask yourself? Is uh, is it a, is it accurate to the to the story? Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds oh, like yeah. a bit of a stupid question, but um, uh, that's uh, when when we get to my when we get to my pick later. Uh, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more, but I'm 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 usually. Uh, I'm usually a bit. Uh, I'm one of those people who who just sort of says, uh, "Is this how it really happened?" Oh yeah, I do believe that it is very accurate, um, like the inquest and everything, how the the disaster played out. Because I mean, they use clips from the like original television broadcast, and when you see like how they act about, you know outside the stadium and in the pens. It is very, very accurate. You know, the fact that you see people running about trying to save people, you know, the amount of um, ambulances that made onto the pitch and in the inquest how the families are very angry about what happened and trying to put their information forward about what happened and everything. And, you know, it's very much accurate. You know, I don't think there was any bit that was kind of dramatised in any way, and I'm sure they must have, like, asked the original families or whatever that were affected about, like, how was your life, how was your life, like, after Hillsborough, you know, and that sort of thing. I'm not sure how they kind of wrote the film, but I gather that is probably what what would have happened. How was your, how was your love life after that? <laughs> Whoa! Oh. 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 Sorry, I just I'm having real bad problems with internet here, but you know. But um. So how was your sex life after the event? Uh... How is your How is your life being affected after the disaster? 
Uh, that's what they. That's how they did it. Probably better. Yeah. So I guess that's all I have to say on this film. And I'm gonna swap back to the laptop because my phone is gonna die if it's not careful. Mm-hmm. Okay. <coughs> See you in a bit. Yep. <coughs> Damn it, drunk pipe. Sorry. What I was going to talk next because. Here's the thing about this, it's because uh, last semester actually, I had to write a essay about a picture, a historical event picture that's like iconic. Yeah, they had to like analyze it and talk about what's inside the picture, and I was trying to figure out what it was to do. Steph's like, do a picture from this event. The, and I was like, okay, so I looked, found a picture, and I did it as an essay, and I ended up had to turn it into an editorial, which is on my YouTube channel, which you can check out. And I made a video all about that event in particular. And I, with my research, I actually it, was, it is a dev- devastating event, and I just like I was like flabbergasted with all that commotion and stuff. And I found that yes, there was that film that Steph talked about, and there's actually a recently BBC released a great documentary up to date. Uh, information about the whole event and what went behind it, all this stuff, and it's a great documentary. Um, there's a lot of great information you can, you can get from watching that as well. So if you're kind of curious about the whole event, I I would actually recommend finding the documentary for the BBC that did they did last year, I believe. So I kind of have experience with that. So with the stuff, I kind of know a little bit more about it. That's that's good. So you would say so you would recommend this movie also. What's it called again? Just Hillsborough. 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 <laughs> Climbing up on Hillsborough Hill. Back I can up. see the city lights. <sighs> I don't know what's going on the last two weeks when trying to do stuff, my laptop just wants to play up. So I just had to move into here because this is why I seem to get better into there. If my if my jokes get too get too uh, sensitive for serious material, please let me know. Kick me in the face. Uh No, I will just give you another rectal exam. What? Okay, again, from my perspective, you just fingered Steph's belly button. (laughs) And she loved it, too. (laughs) Oh, Jesus. (coughs) Okay. Steph, Steph, we're losing you. I won't do it. I pro- I I won't do it. I promise. Just uncover. I don't. I won't do it. So maybe I'll go this corner. That corner. Yeah. Let's see. Mike's just Mike's just fingering everybody tonight. <laughs> fingering party. <laughs> so okay, this is interesting because I went. F- Full in on this, and I discovered a film that's very interesting in concept. Okay, so when it comes to biographical films, there's a lot of biographical films about musicians. You've seen them pop up here and there. You've probably heard about uh, the Jimi Hendrix biographical film with um, Andre 3000 from Outkast, I believe. You ha- there's the the James Brown biographical film. There's the there's so many of them popping up here and there. Um, there's one about Bob Dylan uh, that came out cause this is 10 years ago uh, called I'm Not There. You can't understand if I'm singing. It's interesting. I've wanted to see this particular film because I, I hear, isn't this a movie where there's several different parts that are composites of different pieces of uh, Bob Dylan's personality but not really a biopic? It's it's interesting because uh, Bob Dylan's life is very. If you follow his life, his life goes through many different personalities and per- different like sections. 
And so I learned about Bob Dylan a lot, actually, through this. It's interesting. It's not really... It's like, if you like if you don't know about Bob Dylan, this might confuse you a bit, but uh, there are six actors playing different, like, personalities of Bob Dylan during his life. Um, oh. So, because each, each era, well, not era, but, like, each section of his life has a different personality, different persona, per se. So you got six... Oh, it's, it sounds, sorry, it sounds a little bit like, um, a sort of series they did a couple of years ago over here where they documented the Queen's life in different ways, and they had four actresses play the Queen at different stages of her, her life. Yeah. Yeah, more or less. Um, I should look this up, actually, on Wikipedia, because I'm trying to think about... Um, you have, like I said, six great people playing different parts of D Bob Dylan's life. Um, fun fact, uh, besides The Dark Knight, Christian Bale and Heath Ledger star in this film. So before The Dark Knight, they actually appeared in this movie. Then They're not on the screen together, but they are kind of intertwining with stories. Um, Christian Bale plays... Uh, one part of Bob Dylan's life and he's like the rocker of the era for Bob Dylan uh, yeah, he's he's Bob Dylan's rock side he plays Jack Rollins uh, Jack Rollins persona of Bob Dylan where he's you know trying to like, like I said this movie is complex because you're trying to understand each era each like each persona of Bob Dylan, and you, it, they kind of intertwine. And actually, with the Christian Bale Jack Rollins portion of the film, it kind of looks like a documentary. Actually, it kind of had they have interviews with people, you have it like a news broadcaster doing the thing. So it's kind of the film's kind of intertwined. Like it's like I said, a docudrama because it has like a documentary feel to it. Heath Ledger, however, plays a actor named give me a sec here uh, by Robbie C Clark Robbie Clark who portrays Jack Rollins in a biopic and it's there's a film within a film called Grains of Sand so uh, you see Heath Ledger's side of it where he, he's played uh, Jack Rollins and he's going through his life you know being playing a part of Bob Dylan in a way and it kind of, each era of so okay Jack Rollins Christian Bale uh, Jack Rollins depicts Dylan's Dylan during his acoustic protest phase uh, Heath Ledger plays Robbie Clark an actor who portrays Jack Rollins at a biopic and becomes fa as famous as the person he portrays he experiences the stress of the marriage he went through reflecting Dylan's personal life around the time in 1975's Blood on the Tracks um, the, you have other, you have other actors as well. You have Kate Blanchett. You have a female playing a male role, playing Jude Quinn. Um, Quinn closely follows Dylan's mid '60s adventures in his dangerous game, games into an existential breakdown. And Kate Blanchett, she has won. Her portrayal in this movie is like phenomenal. Like she gets into the character. Like you can see, like, the, and each actor has like a, a Bob Dylan mannerism, like the voice kind of in a way. You can hear the the Bob Dylan voice coming out of the, the actor's mouth. Um, I'm trying to to sort of talk a little bit like this. Just a little bit, not too much, not too heavy. Um, I'm trying to think. It's like the movie intertwines between all these six personas. It's interesting because it doesn't just stick to one persona. Like it doesn't. It's not like it's a not a. It's not. It's not linear. It's like non-linear format in a way. It's just kind of intertwines in in between it all. I mean, at the most, like if you, like I said, the Heath Ledger and Christian Bale portions are kind of intertwined in a way because of course they're kind of connected. Um, the Kate Blanchett so portion. Sorry. It's almost like um, anthology. In a way. In a way, yeah. Um, I think there are 
there is uh, Richard Gere plays um, Billy the Kid, which, uh, if you don't know, uh, Billy refers to Dylan playing the role of Alias in uh, the, the Western Pat Garrett and the Billy and the Kid. So it's kind of like the Western side of Bob Dylan, in a way. So you see like Richard Gere playing Billy the Kid, and it's in the small town of Riddle, and it's like this old-timey town. So that's that. It's... I mean, like, you see... When you see his, like, part of it come up, he loses the dog right away. Like, his his dog named Henry. And he's like, Henry, get back over here, Henry! And, like, at the end of the movie, it kind of comes to circle, actually, because he hops on, on a train, and all of a sudden the dog appears again. It's like, Henry, come on, Henry! And the dog's like, oh, fuck this, I ain't following you. It's, it's just... Uh, I'm trying to think. There's one more. There's two more actors. I'm sorry. Um, actually, you might know uh, Ben Ben Wisha, Ben Wisha, who is the new Q in the Bond film. He he mm, plays. Yes, yeah, he plays Arthur R- Rimbob. Uh, Rimbob is a depicted as a man being questioned and responding with quotes from Dylan's interviews and writings. So you see him just sitting at a desk, and some guys interviewing him, and they, you see him pop up with quotes and you know, things that happened during his life, you know. And then, this is the strangest... Okay, and I, I shouldn't say strangest, it's kind of bold. What, the last casting, you might not know the actor, uh, Marcus Carl Franklin, but he's a black kid actor. There is a black, Af- like an African-American child actor playing a portion of Bill Dylan, Bill, Bob Dylan's life named Woody. And this is like referring to Dylan's youthful obsession with the folk singer Woody Ger- Woody Guthrie. Guth- Guthrie, yeah. So, you know, he's traveling on the train. And he's got this guitar guitar case with him. He's just it's weird. It's like, okay, you cast a African American child actor to play this youthful side of Bob Dylan. It's interesting. Like it is so bold that to cast somebody a different color, which I mean, I can understand Kate Blanchett, which is a female portraying a male, so I'm thinking, okay, this film's doing a lot of things and a lot of layers, just complexities upon complexities if you don't know Bob Dylan's life. It just maybe goes... It's like, sorry, maybe it's like kind of maybe um, make you focus more on the story of his life them being like oh look at this set oh look at this camera work oh how wonderful it reminds you that you are watching a film true you know true true it goes all over the place like it goes it does it, like i said it's not stationary into one place like i said it just you see woody in one part you see jack Rowland. you see you see um robbie clark and you see like you just it go from all over the place and it kind of like gives you a message that uh bob dylan uh, he's not just a protest songwriter or a folk uh, singer. He provided a little bit of something the world encapsulated by what, what he brought when it comes to his music and what he did in his life. Um, I mean, it's just, if you want to check it out, I if you're a big Bob Dylan fan, you might know something about this. It's just a very bold... A uh, very daring movie that does something different. Like you don't see a lot of biographical films that goes through like this with six different actors playing basically the same character, same person. Like, like I said, it's like six personas into one to make one person. It's a very non-typical. Uh, very non-typical biographic film. Very non-typical. So. Almost sounds like a bit. Almost sounds like the probably the better way to describe this would be. Uh, uh, as a, not not as a biopic, but more or less a, a story that's inspired by. That's a key word there, inspired, because during the credits you see inspired by, Dylan's music and life. Because you do hear a lot of Bob Dylan's music throughout the whole uh, feature. Like, there'd be, I guess, those songs are at the turn, they, like, try to depict the year and time of each, like, little 
uh, persona of Bob Dylan. And you, so I've heard a lot of Bob Dylan music, so you get to hear a lot of it if you're a big fan of Bob Dylan's music. Um, yeah, like I said, I, I say like we do a, we're doing biographical slash docudrama because that's kind of the same vein because most biographical films can be dramas and like I said in my film there's a little, little bit of documentary portion of it trying to detect one side of Bob Dylan so it's not a true biographical of Bob Dylan himself but I chose it because it's a different angle on the genre itself okay I remember I, I, I remember kind of wanting to see this movie back when it was is out. It's already been ten years. Jeez. Yeah, it's two thousand seven. Uh, two thousand and seven. Actually, let's. What is the exact date? I believe the exact date. November twenty first, two thousand seven. So it's six going on seven. No, it's nine going on ten years. So, uh, I was directed by Todd Hayes. Actually, uh, Todd Hayes has done some stuff. He. He has done uh, Raisin Safe, Velvet Goldmine, Carol. No, he did Carol from two years ago. If you've seen that, that was that was at the Oscars recently. Um, and no, this, I want, I want to see, I wanted to see Carol, but I just you know never got around to seeing it. So. Yeah, and actually this year he's got a new movie coming out called Wonderstruck. So based on a novel of the same name. Oh. Ooh, Wonderstruck! <laughs> yeah, it's coming out next month, so I figure I'd talk about Todd Hayes. I mean, I, I'm just like, I mean, if you're interested in Bob Dylan, I mean, I'm Not There is probably something you might be interested in seeing. Okay. Well, I'm not a Bob Dylan fan, so who knows when I'll be able to sit down and watch it. It's two hours and fifty. Oh, it's or... it's two two hours and eight minutes long. So you want to sit through a two hour movie about Bob Dylan's personas? You can go for it, people. Um, speaking of like a docudrama biopic, let's go to Cody. Well, all right, like, Coaster. What well, like what do you got that's like so bold? Well, but... From a dark disaster to an interesting biopic, now on to something fun involving science fiction. The movie I picked, or docudrama, is An Adventure in Space and Time. It came out in 2013, coincided with the 50th anniversary of Doctor Who, from which I am a big fan of. Or as I like to call it, Check the Fornicator. <laughs> That, that could be the biography title for Charlie Sheen, Check the Fornicator. Yikes. Uh, basically, this movie centers around the first Doctor, William Hartnell, portrayed well, rather greatly by um, David, David Bradley. Bradley. Yeah, David Bradley, who I look forward to playing the official Doctor come Christmas. But that's later on. It basically centers around how Doctor Who first started from concept all the way to the end of the first Doctor's run. And, and uh, on a front note, if I must say, the lookalikes they got for this movie are pretty spot on. And usually that's a bad thing when it comes to movies. He looks just like the character. Who cares if he acts like shit? He looks like, like a man who did it. No, you have to... You have to put... You have to act. In an I in an ideal situation, and yes, I have seen this movie, so I can, so I can say this, you you have to pick up on, you have to pick up on not just the look, of the of the person, but also the mannerisms. It's like, uh, just like with uh, Ed Wood, you know, the guy uh, Martin Lando playing Bela Lugosi, nailed it, without having to look like Bela Lugosi. That was just makeup. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and in this movie, David Bradley, uh, who I was mainly familiar with as an actor playing uh, the groundskeeper in the in the Harry Potter movies, Finch, Argus, <laughs> Argus Filch, Filch. Oh, Filch. Oh, Filch. She's English. And she got it wrong. Oh. <laughs> He's 
sit, yeah. He's a, and he's, I, I've always seen him in roles like that, every time, every time he's popping up and something like I saw him in a Sweeney <laughs> Todd production one time, playing Sweeney's dad, he's essentially the same type of really sort of just gruff looking, could be big, got a really big face and look like a say, because he always looks like he's about to say, oh, I see you've just murdered my cat. Uh, <laughs> I think, I think they are in trouble now, aren't they? Didn't he, I think he appeared in a Doctor Who episode during uh, the eleventh Doctor era. Uh, I think it was like spaceships and dinosaurs. Yes. And nice now one. here he is. Is he playing the and Doctor? Now here he is. Yeah, he's playing William Hartnell, and he. I I. He looks like him. He he can act pretty much like him it's pretty it's pretty spot on yeah um go on though it's your movie yeah yeah Is that, really it's my movie i thought it was yours <laughs> oh well the movie is actually told through flashbacks over the three-year period and it starts off with Sidney newman and that right Verity Lambert, sorry. English people have such strange names. What's wrong about... What's strange about Steph? <laughs> Nothing, that's normal. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. A normal name for an abnormal person. <laughs> that's one way of looking at it. <laughs> anyway, it starts off with the concept and the beginning of how the show is made, and... I'm not sure how historically accurate, I want to say it is, but the BBC really didn't have much hope for Doctor Who in the beginning to begin with at all from the looks of it. They gave them the wrong uh, the wrong studios to work in, wrong impatient set designers didn't want to work on anything, it was just one mess in the beginning. And, Hi. yeah, and uh, let's address the elephant in the room, need we must. First episode aired on the day of the assassination of JFK. That's always a good sign. Yeah. And they actually kind of handled that in the in the movie kind of interesting because uh, Brian, Brian Cox, who plays Cindy Newman, is reading this script about a description about the Daleks. And while it's happening, you see a guy... Setting up a shotgun, a setting up a shotgun, but a rifle with a sniper scope on it. And I was like, oh, okay, I know where this is going. It's not going to be pretty. Because there are actually a few historical events, like the first Russian woman in space. I forget her name because she's Russian. They have even stranger names than the English. <laughs> True. The Russians aren't going to argue against that. Yep. And. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> and as we, as they develop the show, they introduce all these characters. First of all, of course, David Bradley playing William Hartnell. And according to this, during this time of the career, he was playing gruff, you know, stringy Sten characters. Army type people. It was just you no know, stern and scary. And it was actually through this show that not only did William Hartnell enjoy the shit playing this role. He really did, but a lot of people saw him as, you know, this is the role that pretty much, you know, this is this is what Hartnell, you know, this is what people think of when they hear his name. He's the first Doctor. He originated the series. Mm-hmm. And the entire, and through the whole, and through the whole rest of the movie, we're seeing all these other actors basically recreating scenes from the original show. And one thing that I, that I thought was surprising was William Hartnell himself getting all the line drawing and doing all the flubs. I and you no know, when I look back and think about those episodes, I thought I always thought that was part of the character. You know, mumbling his lines because he's playing an old man. I mean, how many times have we gone in a conversation that we messed up what we said? We messed up someone's name. Story <laughs> of my life. Sometimes I just literally open my mouth and everything just goes blah, 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 blah. Exactly. And exactly. And to me I thought that again I thought that was part of the character. Made him more enjoyable. But nope. Is uh, it's just uh, surprise, surprise. Him uh, 
catching on to old man syndrome. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Again, with what James said, check the fornicator. <laughs> yeah, which was... I, I remember when, when that line uh, came came out, that was one of his... It, it, it didn't make the final cut, obviously, but it was uh, it, it was one of his more infamous flubs on set, and they all had a good laugh about it because uh, what was uh, he's supposed to say? Check the something something else. Falsificator. Falsificator. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, some doohickey on board the TARDIS and whatnot. And he just says, "Quickly, child, we're running out of time. Check the fornicator." <laughs> Who wouldn't, would, when you're working on a show like that, you gotta laugh at stuff like that, so. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Especially the fact that with Doctor Who, there's some weird shit in there. Weird, it wouldn't be, weird it, shit. Would, it, would it surprise you at all if there was an actual fornicator on the, on board the TARDIS? I don't think so. Oh. <laughs> well, the Doctor needs his private time too, so, you know. Mm-hmm. Well, he does at his private time. It's his own affair. I've got two of them oh. right here. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, definitely. You need to laugh at certain things like that because there's some weird shit in um, Doctor Who, like, Mommy, are you my mommy? Mommy, I'm scared of the bombs, Mommy. Yeah, yeah. No, don't say Doctor Who can't be scary because it can be at times. Oh, yeah, That's there. what I'm saying, you know. Yeah. Can be scary. My sister was terrified by that. She had nightmares or whatever, so, you know, Morgan wasn't the only one. <laughs> oh, really? This is the first I've heard of it. What else is Morgan afraid of? No. no. <laughs> I don't uh, know. Uh, uh, all right, hang off track. I don't think he's scared of spiders, you know. Mm. Spiders! Exactly. I don't like spiders. They're scary. But anyway, back on track. Another thing I found about this, uh, found interesting about this movie, as William Hart, as William Hartnell goes on playing the role, as other characters, you know, come in and come out. Every time they do that, they do. They cut to a part. They cut to a in the middle of the BBC office building that's shaped like a question mark. And they're doing press coverage of it, and every time they change the characters, who's ever supposed to be working with them is like further off to the side, you know, drifting away, as he is, because yeah, he is drifting away. He is, his mind's going, old man's disease, and he doesn't quite know what to do because he likes the role so much. What does he um? Did William Hartnell have dementia? He uh, had dementia, and yeah. it was showing. It was starting to show... Yeah, the end of his run. Uh, yeah. Which is... Uh, the film sort of alleges that that's, that's the reason... Uh, that's the reason why they uh, replaced him with uh, Patrick Troughton. Mm -hmm. Is that the actor's name? Mm -hmm. uh, they wrote it... They had to write in at some point that uh, they wanted to keep the show going. Brilliant move, by the way. Oh yes. Uh, you know they they have to say, oh he's the the doctor is just gonna turn into uh, uh, another character. He'll uh, he'll uh, he'll um, regenerate. He's an alien. Regenerate. He's an alien. We'll 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 say that. We'll uh, we'll keep the show going. And. Um, yeah, they. It it was rather it was rather unfortunate uh, when when he left the role mm. uh, because he uh, because he enjoyed doing it so much that he yeah uh, there were certain occasions in which he was actually called back to do it but oddly I've seen some I've seen some interview footage of him uh, briefly you know post. Uh, Doctor Who, and and uh, he, uh, there was at least a, a period of time where he just sort of brushed it off and said, "Oh, that oh that that was really nothing. I, I'll, I'll, uh, uh, I'm an actor. I can I can keep going, and I'll I'll do something else 
that'll that'll be better than that with the rest of my career, you know? Yeah. Uh, Sadly, he never did. Yeah. So I... it kind of, yeah, it kind of makes me question a little bit of the integrity of the production, but I, I do believe, or, or the portrayal of the events, but I do believe that Generally speaking, he must have enjoyed playing the character. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, because uh, it, uh, I believe uh, around the time he came out, I saw an interview with his granddaughter, who's still alive, and according to her, he did enjoy the role. He said it was one of his favorite roles he's ever done. <laughs> well, there goes that theory. <laughs> ah. but uh, yeah, but. And staying on subject, as the movie plays on, when William Hartnell is asked, saying, "Hey, you know, you're not can't remember most of your lines. We're gonna have to replace you." David Bradley actually does have a touching scene where he's standing in front of the fireplace and he just sells it, saying, "You know, he doesn't want to go. He doesn't want to leave the role because he likes it so much." And on, and on, and on another note. Uh, one of the final scenes in the movie is where William Hartnell is getting ready to film his last scene, you know, his regeneration scene, and he looks over and he sees the um, then current doctor, played by Matt. I, yeah, yeah. See, a lot of people, a lot of people are half and half in that scene. Some people like it, some people don't. I will not lie. If I, I would be lying if I didn't say this. When I saw that scene, it did bring a tear to my eye a bit because I thought, it's like, I'm like, oh, damn, man. Even if Matt Smith wasn't really there, he was green screened in poorly. I mean, one um, one second he's standing on one side of the TARDIS, the next shot he's standing right in the middle of the damn thing. It's like, how do you do that? How are you phasing through matter? What is this? <laughs> what do you, who do you think you are, Doctor Who? Ah! No! <laughs> Doctor. But, but yeah, that, I actually kind of like that scene. And the movie finally ends with an actual clip of William Hartnell saying one of his, one of his more famous quotes from the show. And all in all, I say this was actually done pretty well. I want to see more docudramas like this documenting each Doctor's progression through time. It might not have to make the uh, Tom Baker's a two-parter, but... <clears throat> <laughs> But yeah, the start of some yeah, this movie starts at the beginning of what will become one of the longest running sci fi shows ever. Yes, I'm saying that Star Trek, you can suck it. Doctor Who is better. Oh. You've just started a flame war. Bring it, bring it, come on. <laughs> and I look forward and again I'm looking forward to the Christmas special where once again the doctor's going to regenerate, and I don't care if he's going to regenerate into a woman. I actually look forward to seeing what she can do. Uh, you know when they, you know when they announced that and they were like making a big deal of that it's that it's going to be a woman this time. I'm just sort of like, so. What? I will say this. I will what? say this. I will say this. The first boob joke that I hear from the doctor, I'm leaving until we get a new one. I've gained boobs, but my hair's still not changed out. <laughs> you okay. lost your arms in battle, Doctor, but you've got some nice breasts. That's <laughs> not... We need a ginger doctor, damn it. Needs to be a ginger. I was just thinking, you know, every time the doctor regenerates recently, and he's like, my hair's still not ginger. I'm like, Cody, you can play it. Ah. Oh, sure, insult them more. Make them American. All right. <laughs> They're like, uh-uh, <laughs> No, no, we, we, we'll, we'll take the woman. We'll take the woman. Well, there was that time in the 90s when they tried to make a TV movie. No! No! Uh. <laughs> I mean, we could, like, we could do it in a Dick Van Dyke way. I'm going to save this planet. Come on, K9, let's go. Palm again. No! Oh, give, give him some credit, you give, know. Give Paul hey. some credit. Come on. I mean... Why they don't give him a break, like create a spin-off series called The Time War with Paul McGann. Duh. Yeah. Duh. I, I have to say, like, you're going to find this really um, weird, Cody. As a 
British I'm person with tea <laughs> running through my vein. Um, I'm not a fan of Doctor Who, but my family are. And the thing is, about the news about the Doctor being female, I don't mind. I think it's going to be pretty cool, and it's nice yeah. to have a change, you know. Yeah. But the fact that, you know, I think it'd be good, because then the role can open up in the future for other female actors. Oh, yeah. I mean, they've hinted at this before, you know, throughout the past couple of seasons. And yeah, you can be white, you can be black, fat, thin, woman. I'll be very interested when they do a she-male doctor. That'll be interesting to see. <laughs> Steph will definitely become a fan when that happens. <laughs> hug, hug, hug. Fuck, fuck you. <laughs> So, yeah, uh, if you're a Whovian like me, you enjoy it. Yeah, a I hope. Hug... <laughs> yes. yes, definitely go, go see it. It's a, it's a good fun. You, you'll laugh, you'll cry. You know, you might gain some new insight onto Doctor Who. Yeah. I will quickly say now before we move on to the next film, just to get this out of the way, I'm not a fan of Doctor Who and I'm not a fan of James Bond. And I'm British. Google that shit. Oh, double burn. Oh, okay. Doctor Who. Oh, uh, Doctor Who is one thing, but Bond, the gloves are off. Ow. I don't oh, know. Power. Claws. Well, what about Red Dwarf? Oh, Red Dwarf. I do like Red Dwarf. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> okay. That was a clue, sir. Are you absolutely sure? That does mean changing the ball. <laughs> What about Red Dwarf USA? Uh... Um... I saw the little... Sort of, um... Documentary on it on the, uh, Season 5 DVD pack, but, um... Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah, we should we should stop that. I mean, we tried Doctor Who, we tried Red Dwarf. Americans should just stay away from stuff like that. We can't do it right. Yeah, they've done the in-betweeners, they've done the office... I mean, have you seen that Death Note movie? Uh... Don't start, don't start. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, mean, uh, I can see the steam coming out of his, coming out of his ears. I, I, I've heard in the past, people don't like the freaking live-action Japanese version of Death Note. I'm sitting there going, uh, not anymore. I have a newfound respect for these movies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway. Yes, on a side note to movie makers... Stop adapting manga and anime. So far, you are... I don't know how many for how many, but they all suck. Uh, okay. Come on, Speed Racer's a guilty fucking pleasure. Yeah, if you're on acid. I, I didn't have to Sorry. be on acid. Sorry, yeah. what's your guilty pleasure, babe? S speed Racer. Oh, okay. S speed being the word. That's the only decent one from one of the bunch. Everything else... Yeah, I can understand. I still have to see Ghost in the Shell. Yeah. I was about to say, what about the new Ghost in the Shell? Yeah. yeah. Scott Johansson in a skin-tight suit. Oh. Yeah, well, what else is new? <laughs> but I tell you what, like, when Mike was talking to me about the new film and whatever, and everybody's like, you know, kind of having their picket signs because of white watching. Uh, whitewashing. Like, Mike is just one of those people who just take a flamethrower and just burn all those picket signs. I'm like, screw you, I like it! <laughs> Shut up, you fools. He, she did a good job. Like, for the character she played, she did she did fine. Like, I understand the original character, but for what Scarlett Johansson did, she did a okay job. I'm not saying it's the best. Oh, baby, the it's, it's okay. It's okay. Yo! I pity the fool who has a problem with whitewashing, but I will pity that fool with my flame from all these pickets. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know why. I, I will watch. I will watch Ghost in the Shell just to piss off all the, all the uh, politically correct SJWs out there. Hardcore fans. <laughs> I did. Oh, whitewashing didn't do any harm with Doctor Strange. No. Not mm -hmm. at all. Not at all. Uh -huh. Yeah. Exactly. Anyway. Anyway. James, you are last but not least. 
And you got yes. And you got thirty minutes. I got thirty and minutes. Go. Okay, so my choice for the uh, uh, to to top this thing off is a little film from uh, 2015 called Walt Before Mickey. A movie, yes. The story of young Walt Disney in his uh, in his early days, uh, prior to uh, him and Roy Disney. Uh, uh, coming up with what we now know today is as, uh, as uh, Walt Disney Studios, one of the most successful empires. Uh, uh, pretty Hail much. The uh, Hail the mouse. Uh, you got the. Don't I? No, you got you got the wrong Disney character. It's Donald. He's supposed to be doing that. Remember. <laughs> 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 okay. One of the greatest, uh, one of the greatest Disney moments ever to be censored. So, um. Oh, you say that, and some comedian did uh, an impression of Donald Duck getting a blowjob. Yeah. That and it was, was Mike. That was one of the greatest recordings I've ever heard in my life. All right, you've already heard it. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Don't move, I'll get you a towel. Oh, yeah, play with my ball. Play with my balls. Oh, yeah, play with my ball. Play with my ball. Uh oh. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh Hold still. Oh, wait. Keep still. I'll go get. Wait, don't move. I'll go get you a towel. Uh, okay, but for all that, yeah. okay, this is, uh, yeah, this is a, a 2015 film, uh, starring Thomas Ian Nicholas in the role of, uh, of Walt Disney, uh, for, uh, for those not familiar with that name right off the bat, if you were a 90s kid, you may remember him from Rookie of the Year. Uh, or, or, uh, or if not that, uh, he was also, he was also in the American Pie series. Oh, uh, that playing. Pie. <laughs> Yeah. Mm, pie. Yeah, not the, uh, not, not oh. the pie banger guy. Oh, the, 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 the kid in King's Court kid. The King Arthur's Court, yeah. Yeah. That guy... He's all grown up now, of course. Huh. And, um, yeah, he, uh, if, if this role, if, if this movie is good for anything, it really, it really shows that he needs, uh, he needs better dramatic roles. Uh, uh, he, uh, he's, he's, he's not a, he's not a bad actor. He, really portrays this uh he's he's putting uh, everything into this uh, uh performance as young walt disney he even kind of looks like him which works uh that's uh, that's one that thing tom that i'm hanks. much more than tom hanks uh yeah you you think by now the disney company would uh, uh would be actually good at at representing the guy who created it but <coughs> um wait no. was Walt before mickey made by the walt disney company um it was independently produced uh oh okay it was it was um let's see the production companies uh, conglomerate media and alb productions so they they have the they have the rights to talk about all the really early stuff about the the company. I don't know who funded this exactly. It wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me at all if uh, if the Disney company funded these guys on the side to do it. It's actually based but on a book too. It's based on a book uh, called Walt 
before Mickey, of course, that was written about uh, Disney's early days, and it sort of follows it. This is the this is my my breaking point with the with the movie, is that they have solid. They have really really solid. Uh, uh, portrayals they they get so, they get so many things right about about Disney's early days um, and then they get so much so much uh, wrong wow. and when it's wrong and it, and when it's wrong you don't have to know Disney's history you just have to you just have to be a, a viewer who's thinking and saying to yourself, um, uh, did this really happen? Or did this really happen like this? Uh, see, they talk about him, uh, you know, wanting to be a, they talk about, they talk about him wanting to be an animator ever, or an artist or doing something animated, uh, drawing related ever since he was a little kid. Uh, yeah, that's accurate to his, uh, to who Walt Disney was as a person. Um, yeah, I I did have a, a bit of a chat with uh, Matt Brunet over this, uh, so uh, he he his his thoughts over it were uh, a, a lot more. I, I'm I'm a lot more forgiving of it, I guess, but I. Uh, but at the same time, I, I do find it uh, to a degree insulting. When you change the aspect, when when you change the uh, of the story, when you change the uh, the events that that happened uh, in a biopic, and you and you pass this off as a true story, it's it's to me it's particularly insulting to the to the people who are involved because you're telling them. That their life story is not interesting enough to be made into a film. If that makes any sense whatsoever, am I wrong here? So, uh, no, uh, no, I don't think you are. So, jumping ahead a bit, you won't recommend this movie to anyone. I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm I'm not gonna re- I'm not gonna recommend it per se. I just I I'm just gonna say. Uh, uh, proceed with caution. Uh, you know, go in, go in with, uh, uh, go in with um, uh, a mindset that says uh, what what you see may not may not be entirely accurate. Yes, he, yes, he did uh, he did do the Laughogram Studios uh, in his early days. Hello, uh, Steph. Back the bathroom. Yay! <laughs> Yay! Welcome back. Thank you. So, yes, he did. Uh, he did do the laughogram stuff in his in his early days. Uh, you know, he he hired together a small team, and uh, and did stuff for newsreels. I watched some of that stuff when I was in college. Uh, it's it's very, it, it's very interesting. Uh, early work. Um, when he he went bank, uh, he did go bankrupt, I think, and he did uh, he did have to shift gears after that and start doing, uh, start producing the Alice shorts, loosely based off of uh, Alice in Wonderland. Uh, these these were some, these were some very ahead of their time types of short types of animations. Uh, I don't. Not not too many animators out there were filming a live actress in front of a in front of a really blank uh, stage and then compositing characters around them, which is exactly what these shorts were. And uh, it, even though even if you watch them as silent shorts, um, uh, you'll get a you'll get a a, a pretty good. Uh, a, a pretty good grasp of, of why this was such an important piece of, of history. What didn't happen? 
Oh, this is hilarious. This this is the one part where the the movie dives into dives into comedy territory for a little bit. After the Laughogram Studios uh, falls apart, um, it the movie makes it look like everyone bailed on him. Well, you know, uh, they uh, they make it look like he was uh, uh, he was completely homeless and poor and disheveled and eating out of trash cans. Wow. For a little while. And this is where... This is where... Uh, the, the film is way too over the top that it inadvertently... Yeah. You... When, when you're watching this, you, you don't know that... You may not know that this... Uh, it didn't happen like this, but you don't need to know Disney's history to look at this and say, yeah, it didn't quite happen like this. You know why? Because he's kicked out of the Laughogram Studios with him, and the one thing that he takes with him is a little mouse that was in the studio. And he puts it in his shirt, and he's like, well, at least I still have you, little buddy. What's your call so, with? Apparently Walt Disney was scared of mice, and yet he was able to create Mickey Mouse and that sort of thing. So, he was, oh, so he was scared of mice? Apparently, well, apparently, I don't know. Um, the, see, that I wouldn't have known, but the, yeah, they, he goes out to live on the street, and the only, the only friend that he has is a little mouse that he put in his, in his shirt pocket, and he's going through... And he's going through trash cans and uh, and getting half-eaten sandwiches. This did not happen. This did not happen. Um, and then the ultimate tragedy strikes. The ultimate tragedy strikes. When he's sitting on the when he's sitting on the the street corner. Um, uh, eating a half-eaten sandwich and giving some cheese to his little mouse friend. And a policeman rounds the corner and says, Excuse me, sir, you're not supposed to You're not supposed to be here. Wait a minute, don't I know you? And he steps a little closer. And he almost steps on the mouse. And Disney's like, Oh, no, don't do that, you'll hurt him! And he, hover, and he hovers over this, this little mouse. And the, there's a scuffle, a couple of... Uh, a couple of trash cans are knocked over, and the mouse, it appears, has run off. And Disney is so, is so, uh, so sad that his little friend has left him. I'm just like, this is so. This did not happen. No. This did not happen, and you don't need to. You don't need to be a historian. I'm kicking myself saying that. Uh. So how do, how does it how does it bounce back? Well, let's see. We got other stuff. Uh, we got other other characters that he did work with. Um, <clears throat> Oswald. They do go into the Oswald uh, years as well, and they do show they do show him working with Ub Iwerks. Uh, uh, they they do show him working with Rudolf Ising, uh, who later went on to form uh, Harmon Ising Productions. Uh, with you, went on to produce Cat Gets Boots. Yeah, with Hugh Harmon. Uh, yeah, 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 with Hugh Harmon. I believe there's uh, also in there uh, uh, portrayed as Fred Fred Quimby, really, really, really briefly. At one point, I think uh, he's he's portrayed as uh, someone who Disney comes to with with some of his works. For your, those of you who don't know, Fred Quimby was a producer over at MGM. Uh, familiar, uh, very well known for uh, uh, producing the theatrical <laughs> Droopy uh, and.
wearing Tom and Jerry shorts uh, during the 40s and whatnot. But this was, of course, way before that. This is, we're talking the 1920s here. Um, he had, uh, Disney had to compete with, Disney had to compete with uh, Felix the Cat and, and stuff like that. Uh, he had to. Uh, he, he did have to make something that that uh, that worked that that left an impact. He did go on to work with uh, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, for, for some reason, I thought I was always. Uh, I was always told that uh, he created the Oswald character. The film sort of makes it look like he didn't. It was uh, it was a, a role that was it was a, a character that was in, inherited by him, and he works for uh, he does work for uh, Charles Mintz, who is a uh, who is a producer funding his stuff. Who lived in New York? Who uh, uh, who sends a, a mustachio twiddling uh, a man by the name of George, I think, uh, to come and over overlook the uh, the production of the shorts. He, and this is again bogus territory. This guy's. Uh, this guy's portrayed as sort of a, a snidely whiplash uh, type of character who is just you can you can tell even by the accent he's kind of evil you know wow <laughs> um something something tells me about that about this is that might this part of it might not be accurate so you're you're what you're getting here is It's more like an adaptation of the life of Walt Disney. A very bad adaptation. But not, but but not an actual. Um. Uh, but not an, an entirely accurate portrayal. The performances are great. Uh, the uh, the events, generally speaking, are, uh, and in their and in their history. As shown, they are accurate, but not. Um, yeah, it, with it's probably about fifty percent there. So, would you fault that on being the script and screenplay mostly? I would, I would fault that. Uh, I would fault that in part of the of the director. I would fault that in part in in part of the uh, screenplay writers. I um, and need, it's and it's not, huh? I need to say director because uh, this is interesting because the original director dropped out of the movie and they actually hired another director to replace him or her and I couldn't find the original director but uh, Kua Lee replaced the original director. He's a Vietnamese director and this is his first directorial debut as a director. So he had so much to do with this movie he tried to do it so much to make this movie work and to to his credit it's it's a it, it's not a, a half ass production it's uh, it, it's just uh, in terms of accuracy that's where it falls apart mm-hmm right so I mean, I, I, I can't I, think... I can't blame him because the director didn't know much about Disney except for animation. Um, he took 11 days to take over the micro-budgeted effort for the movie, um, but he devoured the 400-page book, which the movie was based on, in two versions of the script. There's two versions of the script to make this work. So he took everything to take it in, and he, uh, he shot it in Orlando for 17 days... Uh, he came from a short film background, so he, he knew how to edit. He was shooting to edit. Uh, for most scenes, the actors got only two takes. 
uh, he had to go back to his grassroots of guerrilla filmmaking. Um, he worked so hard in the shoe that he developed bronchitis and pink eye. Wow. Just on working this movie alone. There's so much dedication here, I can feel it, just from understanding what the director had to go through to make this film work. For a first-time director, not knowing not, not knowing about Walt Disney himself, but he had to read a bunch about him, trying to make this screenplay work to his advantage with the acting and I'm the gonna actors. I'm going to have to blame... I, I'm going to have to, like I said... Uh, I'm gonna have to uh, lay some lay some blame on the the screenplay writers because again this is this is uh, this is based on a book and if you actually read the book that it's based on you know that these events didn't happen uh, the way that it is Matt kept Matt kept telling me uh, basically to, basically that much you know, maybe I should maybe we should all sit down and read the book instead. But how do you get Pink Eye? I don't know. Working on this. I don't know what he did for this movie, but I'm reading the article that one of the uh, uh, for press, and it just he said about yeah. I was like, what? How did you get Brockheis and Pink Eye from doing this movie? What did you do when filming this movie? I don't know. I know. I know. The mouse found out what he was doing and did not like it, so he cursed him. Either that, or he was working so hard that his immune system was a bit run down, so he was more susceptible to getting, uh, like, getting infections and viruses. Oh, it could be. Could be. Yeah. I haven't had, I haven't had pink eyes since I was in middle school. But anyway, <laughs> that's because I don't have anyone farting into my pillow anymore. <laughs> uh. Anymore. There was a Not time. Not that I did have to begin with, but anyway. Uh, yeah, so. I mean, it's usually when it comes to adapting these stories, it's usually dependent on the screenwriters writing the screenplay to adapt the, the life story into a feature length movie. So, so why wasn't the accurate story interesting enough to uh, to make into a film I don't know I, I, I wouldn't That's, I wouldn't say this it, is I mean this is Walt Disney this is this is who they want to see this is uh, see that's the, that's the thing because um, he was a last minute replacement for as a director and the guy's like hey I want you to come over and make a Disney film a Disney film? No, an indie film about Walt Disney, and he was just like, oh, okay. So, like, this is a first time, like, imagine you're a first time director, and you get a call, like, out of nowhere, you think a senior short film work, and they know who you are. Hey, hey, could you come and direct this movie about Walt Disney? How would you feel at that point? I mean, you gotta get, dig, dig deep into Walt Disney. Like, like you said, he read the 400 page book and two versions of the script. So, they did what they did with this script, somehow. And he just worked, like you said, he, they filmed for 17 days in Orlando. They, I mean, that's a short run, uh, shooting time just to get this movie made. 14 days. Just give or take, whatever. So, it, I mean, it's an indie it, film. It's an independent film. I mean, if it was a bigger budget movie about it, I would understand they would put more, a little bit more effort into it. Yeah, they don't, uh, yeah, it doesn't look like an indie film. That's what I find most impressive about it. It doesn't, it doesn't look like they don't, they don't know what they're doing. It looks like, you know, this is, uh, this is a, a very professionally, uh, put together, put together piece. So I'm, so on be on behalf of his efforts towards, Getting a version of the story done and out there, I, I, I can commend him for that. I would just like to see. Uh, I would just like to know. Um, he's probably he's probably thrown right in the in the middle of this. If uh, uh, if if he if 
he only had 10 days to prepare for this thing. Uh, and they, he's already got to work with, uh, with uh, like you said, two scripts. Yeah, two versions of the and script. And he's got two versions of the script. Then it's it's uh, it's probably not for them, not for him to say at this point. Uh, wait, guys, why would you write? Why would you write this like this? We need to go back and and fix that. We need to go back and make sure we don't have Walt Disney eating out of a garbage can. It's the humanite them and make us sympathize for them. Uh, yeah. Um, there are some. There are some gross. Maybe he, maybe he didn't have much in terms of the casting either because, uh, I can tell you this much, Thomas e. and Nicholas, I can I can see him as Disney. Uh, he works in the role. He act, he acts it out very well. Or a version of Disney. We have, we have, playing in the role of Roy Disney, his brother, oh God. we have John Hader, pull me dynamite. Mm -hmm. who's playing it with the same voice that he does with every other role. Essentially, he's not completely losing it. He's not going 100% Napoleon here, but you can definitely tell that that's, that that's who it is playing the role. It's just sort of in between. And I'm, I'm kind of baffled by this choice. Maybe he's, maybe, maybe they just sort of thought, well, we'll try him and see if he can put on a dramatic role here. But he doesn't look like Roy Disney remotely. Now, if you go back and look like look at pictures of Roy of Roy in his in his younger days, um, I believe that these two characters I believe that these two uh, these two characters on film are brothers because they you know they they're palling around in the office they act like brothers would and there's uh, so there's little moments like that that work especially I also want to say. In in terms of of portraying uh, Di uh, Disney as a character, you see why I, I we know th I know this much going into it when he when he lost the contract to to work on Oswald the Lucky Rabbit, uh, he wanted to. Uh, he wanted to uh, create a similar character and have that success off of it. He wanted to create Mickey Mouse, which uh, in the beginning uh, apparently was uh, uh, what was that other what was that other crazy name that they gave him? Name about Willie? No. Yeah. Mortimer? Mortimer Mouse. Yeah. And uh, and when with with uh, with Mickey Mouse, uh, he was he was hardlined on uh, on keeping control of, of that creation. He did not lend uh, he did he did not lend out uh, Mickey uh, Mickey's uh, image or or character to any other studios. I don't even think the... I don't, you don't even see him being drawn in this movie. Well, uh, I don't think they can get away with that at all. No. They talk about it. They do talk about it. Then that's, a, that's about uh, as, as far as they go, because uh, I remember on an alternate story... Uh, MGM once came to uh, once once came to to Disney saying we got this movie with Gene Kelly and we want him to dance with an ad animated mouse and we were wondering if uh, if uh, if you'd like to lend us Mickey and he said no that movie ended up being Anchors Away and Gene Kelly instead danced with 
Jerry. Jerry mounts. And Jerry talks. And he talked, and no one complained then. <laughs> but uh, it, and that is one of the that was one of the uh, greatest classic musical scenes ever, pretty much. Um, you don't see Disney. You don't see uh, the Disney company uh, lending him off to uh, any other roles, and that's why. That's where this movie portrays his character as accurate as saying, is saying, uh, this is the type of guy that he he became, crazy with copyrights. Uh, it worked in the end. <laughs> Stop it there one second, but yeah, that's ten. True. It's accurate in saying that he's. He's one of the first. He was one of the first studios to give women jobs in the animation stu- in the animation industry, which was rare for the time. It's about it's a half and half movie, for me. It's interesting. There's a couple of quotes here at the end of this article I was reading. Uh, the director said that I always felt like Walt Disney was hovering over me, overing us. Uh, he said it was like, "Hey man, I know this is a low budget deal, but my story needs to be told." Uh, he said, the ultimate Disney story uh, is that of a, a man determined to create a product, an environment that could change the world. His goal was to make people happy. The characters he developed became symbols of America, and they did change the world. For better or for worse, is up to you. Yeah. Well, I say for better. Hmm. Just don't mock them. Do not mock the mouse. Uh, oh boy! I mean, I mean, oh we gosh. might get. I mean, this video might get flagged because of Stephanie's poo cup. You know. Uh, that is true. <laughs> God. Uh. Yeah. So that is basically it for this podcast. I mean, there's so many other biographical films out there. We could probably pick and choose a lot more to discuss, but maybe we'll save this, pin it onto the wall for another time. And for Cinema Royale, thanks for listening and watching. Remember to give this video a like if you like it, share it if you want to. Please just leave a comment of what biographical films you like and dislike. And uh, yeah, I'll see you guys next time. See you later, folks. Bye. Ciao for now. Stay dramatic and see you in November. Bye.